The purpose of this tutorial is to discuss the care of patients following surgery. We will cover how to go about a post-operative review, post-operative oxygen therapy and the assessment and management of common problems encountered by patients recovering from surgery. Post-operative care also includes the assessment of fluid status and formulation of a plan for fluid therapy. This will be covered comprehensively in the fluids tutorial. Knowledge of post-op care will be useful during your year four anaesthetic attachment, but more importantly, in a couple of years time, this will be a major part of your job. No matter what your career aspirations, you will at some point be a stressed out surgical FY1. When a patient recovering from surgery becomes unwell, you will be the nurse's first port of call. There is evidence that mortality following surgery is influenced more by the recognition and management of complications than it is by their rate of occurrence. It is key that you know how to assess these patients, instigate immediate management and know when to call for help. The first post-operative assessment should take place when the patient returns to the ward following surgery. This allows early detection of any issues and provides a baseline for comparison during subsequent reviews. The post-operative review should include a review of the patient's past medical history, medications, allergies, surgical procedure, intraoperative complications and post-operative instructions. Clinical assessment and examination should be undertaken using a structured A to E approach. This should include assessment of respiratory status, circulatory volume status, mental status, specific symptoms and pain control. The crucial thing here is to be able to recognise when there is a problem and know some basic initial interventions which could be made. You should only accept responsibility appropriate to your level of training and experience and if in doubt, ask for help. Supplemental oxygen should be administered in the recovery area until the patient is fully conscious. Any patient who is already hypoxemic or is at risk of developing tissue hypoxia should be given ongoing supplemental oxygen. Some reasons why a post-operative patient might require ongoing oxygen therapy are shown in this slide. These include patient factors, surgical factors and physiological factors, as well as some forms of analgesia. Variable performance devices are so called because the percentage of oxygen delivered will vary depending on respiratory rate, inspiratory flow rate and the length of expiratory pause. Examples of variable performance devices include the Hudson mask, which is shown on the left, and nasal cannulae. The Hudson mask is appropriate for most post-op patients as the delivery of a fixed percentage of oxygen is not essential. They can be used with an oxygen flow of up to 15 litres per minute. The mask does not form a tight seal around the patient's face and has holes in the sides. Room air is drawn in through the holes to meet peak inspiratory flow and expired gases are vented out of them. The addition of a reservoir bag to these masks increases the attainable percentage of oxygen. Oxygen is supplied to the reservoir bag which fills during expiration. During inspiration, 100% oxygen is drawn from the reservoir. Some air is still entrained around the mask and so the oxygen percentage delivered remains variable as around 60 to 80%. Expired gas is vented through the side holes and around the mask with a valve as well as the oxygen flow preventing expired gas from entering the reservoir. Hudson masks are cheap and widely available but there is low patient compliance and they must be removed for eating and drinking. Nasal cannulae are a suitable alternative in those requiring low level supplemental oxygen. Prongs are inserted into the patient's nose and tubing is looped up around the ears. Gas flows of one to four litres per minute are typically used as higher flows can cause complications such as drying and discomfort, impaired mucosillary clearance and epistaxis. 
The nasopharynx acts as an oxygen reservoir and therefore, even if the patient breathes through their mouth, oxygen will be entrained from the nasopharynx. In some circumstances, it may be desirable to deliver a fixed percentage of oxygen. For example, in patients with chronic lung disease who retain CO2 and rely on hypoxic drive to stimulate respiration. Venturi masks are an example of a fixed performance device. They utilise the Venturi effect to deliver a fixed concentration of oxygen to the patient. As oxygen flows through the constriction in the Venturi device, the pressure after the constriction drops, resulting in entrainment of air, which dilutes the oxygen to the required concentration. The volume of air entrained for a given oxygen flow is determined by the size of the apertures around the nozzle. The narrow end of the Venturi device is connected to standard oxygen tubing and the wide end connects to the mask. They are colour coded and deliver inspired oxygen concentrations of 24 to 60%. The required oxygen flow rate is printed on the side of each device and must be strictly adhered to to ensure the stated percentage of oxygen is being delivered. We will receive a separate tutorial on IV fluids which will give more detailed information on physiology and fluid requirements. It can be difficult to predict fluid requirements in the post-operative period, particularly after major surgery where as well as blood loss, insensible and first base losses must be taken into consideration. As an FR1 on call overnight, you will often be asked to prescribe IV fluids for multiple surgical patients who you may not be familiar with. Ideally, maintenance IV fluids should be prescribed by the day team looking after each patient, and you should only be asked to review if there is a change in the patient's condition or the day team have highlighted them for a review. Unfortunately, this is not always the case. Despite heavy workload and multiple demands on your time, it's important to avoid blanket prescribing of fluids and instead make a clinical assessment of the patient's fluid status and requirements first. The remainder of this tutorial will focus on a few specific post-operative problems or complications. It is important to stress that you will not be expected to manage these issues independently, but you should be able to recognise them and know when and who to ask for help. This may include your own registrar or consultant, the on-call anaesthetist, intensive care, chest physio or the acute pain team. Hypoxemia is defined as oxygen saturation less than 90%. This has multiple causes in the post-operative period. As with any unwell patient, the hypoxic patient should be reviewed using an A to E approach. Assess airway patency. Is the patient talking to you? Are there any added sounds? Is there a seesaw pattern of respiration? If you're concerned that there is any evidence of airway obstruction, call for help. In the meantime, apply high flow oxygen, use basic airway manoeuvres such as head tilt, chin lift, draw thrust and consider using airway adjuncts such as a nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal airway until help arrives. If you are happy with the airway, you can go on to assess the patient's breathing. This will include basic observations and assessment for any signs of respiratory distress as well as auscultation of the chest and other relevant clinical examination. Investigations you may want to consider include an ECG, chest x-ray or ABG. Treatment will include supplemental oxygen therapy as well as appropriate treatment directed towards the underlying cause. If the patient has a very high oxygen requirement or saturations are failing to improve with oxygen therapy, they may require escalation of care to HDU or ITU. This would, of course, be discussed with your seniors. Some causes of post-operative hypoxemia are shown in the slide, but this list is not exhaustive. Hypotension is relatively common in the recovery room, 
it is often transient and benign, related to the residual effects of anaesthetic and analgesic drugs. With severe, ongoing or recurrent hypotension, however, it is extremely important to assess the patient to elucidate the underlying cause. Hypovolemia is an important cause to consider. This may be due to inadequate perioperative fluid replacement or due to ongoing losses, for example from surgical drains or ongoing bleeding. The patient should be laid flat or slightly head down and given supplemental oxygen while further assessment takes place. Signs of hypovolemia include tachycardia, full peripheries, prolonged capillary refill, decreased conscious level and decreased urine output. Look for signs of blood loss on the sheets, on dressings or in drains. And for example, with intra-abdominal surgery, there may be abdominal pain, tenderness or distension. Assess for signs of anemia, such as pallor or conjunctival pallor, and consider performing a bedside haemoglobin, for example, a venous blood gas sample, as well as formal laboratory bloods. Ensure the patient has adequate IV access. A fluid challenge should be given and the hemodynamic response assessed. Ongoing blood loss may require further surgical intervention and senior assistance should be sought early. Another cause of post-operative hypotension is subarachnoid or epidural anaesthesia. This causes sympathetic block resulting in vasodilatation and therefore reduced systemic vascular resistance. Many patients can compensate for this. However, if they're hypovolemic or the block is above T4 level, Severe hypotension with or without bradycardia may occur. The comprehensive management of patients with epidurals is beyond the scope of this tutorial. However, it is a significant cause of postoperative hypertension to be aware of. If the patient has a profound drop in blood pressure or evidence of compromise, you should stop the infusion, contact the anaesthetist and give an IV fluid bolus. Other causes of hypertension to rule out in postoperative patients include sepsis, anaphylaxis, rewarming, MI, PE, cardiac failure and arrhythmias. Both tachy and bradyarrhythmias may occur in the post-operative period. Causes include hypercapnia, hypoxemia, electrolyte or acid-based disturbance, pain, underlying cardiac disease, myocardial infarction, PE and sepsis. You should assess the patient using a systematic A to E approach. Assess for adverse features such as shock, syncope, myocardial ischemia and heart failure. You must do a 12 lead ECG and the underlying cause should be investigated and treated. It is particularly important to create any electrolyte abnormalities. Remember, Blood gas analysers often measure electrolytes in addition to pH, O2 and CO2. This can be very useful while awaiting formal lab results. Senior help should be sought and specific arrhythmias treated according to current ALS guidelines. Acute kidney injury, AKI, is a common problem in the perioperative period and has been shown to be an independent contributor to morbidity and mortality. Its development results from a complex interaction between predisposition, hemodynamic disturbance, nephrotoxic insults and inflammatory responses. There is no one specific treatment for acute kidney injury and its management depends on risk reduction, early detection and supportive measures. There are numerous risk factors for post-op AKI. These include patient factors such as advanced age, cardiovascular disease, existing chronic kidney disease, hypertension and diabetes, and surgical factors such as type of surgery, emergency surgery, prolonged surgery, and intraoperative blood loss. In such patients, you should maintain a high index of suspicion and monitor blood results and urine output in the post-operative period. Management of AKI centres around careful fluid resuscitation and attention to fluid balance, maintenance of adequate blood pressure, and avoidance of nephrotoxins. Patients with metabolic acidosis, hyperkalemia or fluid overload resistant to medical management, as well as those with the uncommon complications such as uremic pericarditis or encephalopathy, will require urgent referral to the renal team or intensive care for consideration of renal replacement therapy.
Surgery is a risk factor for the development of acute delirium in the elderly population. 10 to 50% of elderly patients undergoing surgery will develop delirium. At particular risk are patients with sensory impairment or dementia. Delirium is a medical emergency and carries a high level of morbidity and mortality. It has been linked to increased lengths of hospital stay, increased risk of complications such as pressure sores and falls, and increased rates of admission to long-term care, as well as increased mortality. It is frequently overlooked or misdiagnosed and leads to significant distress for patients, carers and families. Evidence suggests that up to 33% of delirium could be prevented by recognition of, and where possible, modification of risk factors. With any delirious patient, it's important to consider and address polypharmacy, dehydration, pain, infection, constipation, urinary retention, hypoxia and sleep disturbance. Health Improvement Scotland have developed a delirium toolkit which includes useful information on identifying those at risk of delirium and the use of the 4AT assessment tool for the early assessment of those with acute cognitive impairment. The toolkit also includes the TIME Bundle, a framework for the management of acute delirium. It is recommended that this should be instituted within two hours of identification of delirium. You will receive a separate tutorial on pain management. Good post-operative pain control not only alleviates patient distress, but also reduces or prevents other complications such as atelectasis and chest infections, nausea and vomiting, ileus and urinary retention. In practice, a combination of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, opioids and local anaesthetic techniques are used for post-operative pain relief. Post-operative nausea and vomiting affects up to 40% of patients. It is unpleasant and can lead to delayed hospital discharge. In severe cases, it can cause wound dehiscence, bleeding, esophageal rupture or fluid and electrolyte disturbance. Risk factors can be split into patient factors such as female sex, non-smokers, young age, anxiety, history of motion sickness and previous POMV. Anaesthetic factors such as the use of volatile anaesthetics, opioids and nitrous oxide, and surgical factors such as emergency surgery, ENT surgery, gynaecology procedures and gastrointestinal surgery. In the unconscious or semi-conscious patient with post-operative nausea and vomiting, immediate action should be taken as aspiration of vomitus into the lungs may occur. These patients should be placed in the lateral position and suction used to clear the pharynx. In the awake patient, reassurance should be given. Adequate analgesia and hydration should be provided. Surgical causes should be assessed for and ruled out. For example, is the abdomen distended? Antiemetic options include ondansetron, a 5-HT3 antagonist, cyclozine, an antihistamine, prochlorperazine, a D2 antagonist, and dexamethasone, a steroid. In summary, this tutorial has covered post-operative care, including post-operative oxygen therapy. It has also highlighted some of the common post-operative complications which you may encounter as a foundation doctor and how to go about the initial assessment and management of these patients. We have also briefly touched on fluids and pain relief, which are covered in more detail in separate tutorials. Any questions or queries can be answered during your face-to-face -face tutorial or anaesthetic attachment.